Hello, my name is Susan Hepburn. I'm the professor in HDFS 310, and this will be our brief lecture on Chapter 3, The New Genetics. So genetics is a field that has grown quite dramatically in the past 30 or 40 years, and there is much that one can learn about by diving into some of the videos and additional links that we've posted in your module. So if you are a person who doesn't have much of a background in this kind of science and are finding it difficult to learn what you need to learn just by reading, I suggest that you take a look at the videos that we've posted, particularly the product from PBS, which might be able to communicate this information in a really powerful way for you. A couple of things to keep in mind, and that is that in the new genetics, we know that genetics affects everything, but it isn't the only thing that makes us who we are. Nurture also matters, and the expression of your genes is going to depend a lot on the social environment around you and basically in the um, environment and context within which that you grow up. So we will talk a lot about the transition actions between genetics and environment and throughout I will try to focus on the key terms that matter. So right now I want you to know about the term the genome because the genome provides gene instructions that create individual and species specific information. Your genome is kind of like your entire genetic code. Now our genetic makeup is what allows us to have diversity within the species of human beings and in fact these um, foundational ways that genetic codes carry variation is what enables us to have individuality as well as to allow the entire human species to adapt to what's going on in our environment. So um, it makes us stronger to survive whether it's viruses or other things in our environment if each of us has a different genetic blueprint for how to handle the things we come in contact with in our environment. So our genetic diversity is a real tool that helps our entire species survive. Some of the key terms I'd like you to keep in mind are genotype and phenotype. So a genotype is, your, is the individual's genetic code. It's all of the genetic information um, that you have stored in your cells, which I'll talk about in a moment. Your phenotype is the observable characteristics. It's the expression of the genotype in the real world. There are often differences between what the genotype codes for and how a person's phenotype presents. And those differences can come from um, many sources, but two of them are described by the key terms below. When something, when a trait is described as polygenic, that means that that trait is influenced by many genes. So several different genes have to come together in order for a certain trait to be expressed. Intelligence, for example, is thought to be a polygenic trait. Multifactorial is the term that we used when a trait, like intelligence, is affected by many factors. And those factors are genetic and environmental. There are also things that are happening around the person. And these are four very important verbs that you're going to want to keep in mind when we talk about genetic transmission. When a trait is affected by many factors, including genes and environment, those factors can enhance, halt, shape, or alter the expression of the genes. So those are the four verbs that matter a lot for genetic transmission. Enhance, halt, shape, or alter. So we now realize that phenotypes can differ from genotypes depending on how the environment is interacting with the genes in really, really complex ways. So here's a diagram taken from your textbook which can help to show the basics of genetics. So in every human being, we are made up of just millions of cells. Within each and every cell, you have a nucleus, right? That's like the brain of the cell. Within that nucleus are the genetic material that is the underlying genetic code for that person. So every cell has a nucleus that contains all of the DNA that make up that person. All 23 pairs of chromosomes reside in every nucleus of every cell in your body. 
Now chromosomes, as you can see, are made up of these two strands of material that um, form themselves in what we call a double helix design. You can see how the chromosomes wrap around each other and chromosomes are made up of DNA molecules. Chromosomes are a molecule, DNA is a molecule. A molecule being a whole set of chemical combinations. What you can see from this particular diagram is that a gene is going to be a sequence of pairs of chemicals. We call these base pairs and the gene can take up a tiny amount of space on a chromosome or it could take up a larger space on a chromosome. It really varies. But think of it as genes are made up of sequences of two chemicals that are put in different orders and those sequences reside on a chromosome. You have two chromosomes who fold together and all of this is happening in every nucleus of every cell. Therefore, your genetic code is living in each and every one of your cells and those instructions that the cells get on how to create proteins or how to help a human being sustain or grow are really coded by these molecules of DNA. DNA being the shorthand term for DO, I can never say this, deoxyribonucleic nucleic acid. Well, that's terrible. I'm not going to even try to go back and edit that. We'll just call it DNA. It's the molecule that contains your chemical instructions and really helps your cells um, develop these proteins, grow and sustain life. So your chromosomes are molecules of DNA and in a human being we have 23 pairs of chromosomes which add up to 46. Now your genetic code then on these chromosomes you are organized into segments of genes. There are approximately 21,000 genes that are involved in directing protein formation and that also further involves things called amino acids which help with that production. And all of this is supported by these three billion base pairs of four chemicals that come together in different combinations to create the genetic code. So a key term for you to understand is the term allele. This refers to the variation that can make a gene different from other genes that are coding for the same characteristics. Now in many cases genes will be really consistent you know across the entire genome. Other times they'll have several different alleles or several different variations. And a genome, think of it as your overall genetic code, it's the full set of genes that are instructions to make an individual of a certain species. Healthy human beings usually possess 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. 44 of those chromosomes are referred to as autosomes and that basically means that they are carrying genes that code for a variety of things but they have nothing to do with the determination of the sex of the offspring should the person reproduce. So 44 out of 46 chromosomes that you have are autosomes. Now in an autosomal pair they can be homozygous meaning that they are the same as each other or they can be heterozygous meaning that they are different from each other. The same is true in sex chromosomes. So a female has an X chromosome and another X chromosome making up the 23rd pair. Males have two different chromosomes, an X and a Y. Therefore, when reproduction happens, the female is always going to contribute an X to the new chromosome for the new organism but the male could contribute an X or a Y. So in that way it's the males, the fathers, who determine the sex of the offspring because it all depends on whether it's a father's sperm carrying a Y chromosome or carrying an X chromosome. That will determine if the um, child is male, XY or YX, or female, XX. So a few key terms to know about the reproductive process is that a gamete, which is a sperm or an ova, has 23 chromosomes on it. When two gametes come together, they create a zygote. So sperm and ovum come together, they're each bringing 23 chromosomes to make a new offspring. When the pairing happens, 
you will, through the natural course of things, have variations. And one of the terms that you'll hear for this is copy number variations. What that basically means is that it's completely normal in a human being to have segments of genes that repeat each other over and over again. You'll have some times where segments are missing or deleted. Usually, these repeats or deletes don't really add up to any you know, genetic difficulty or major problem. But there are some conditions that are associated with having too many copy number repeats or too many deletions, which we'll cover a little bit later. But in general, having copy number repeats or deletions is completely healthy and normal and begins at the very start of sperm meeting egg. Now it's also a good time to bring up how twins happen because this becomes important in studies of epigenetics or how to determine whether it's genes or environment that have influenced the evolution of a particular trait. So monozygotic twins, also known as identical, originate from one zygote that is split apart very early in development. Individuals who are identical twins have the same genotype, the same underlying genetic code. However, because they have different experiences in the world, they, their genotype is not going to be an exact match at a phenotype level. So identical twins can present their phenotype slightly differently from each other, even though they're identical. And those differences are based on having different environmental experiences. So when scientists are interested in understanding if a certain trait is, you know, what percent is it genetically determined, what percent is impacted by environmental influences, they will often rely on studying identical twins because they know they're interacting with um, research subjects who have exactly the same genotype. So any differences you observe in traits can be associated with the environment. One of the particularly useful natural experiments for epidemiologists who are interested in epigenetics is when they do a study where identical twins have been raised in different environments, perhaps because of adoption or other things. So you have an opportunity as a scientist to compare and contrast how people present based on their genetics are in common, but their environments are really different. And those studies have been very helpful in understanding how various behavioral and physical conditions are influenced by genetics and environment. There's another group of twins that we are interested in, dizygotic twins, which you may think of as fraternal. And these twins are more common than identical twins, and they result when two separate eggs are fertilized by two separate sperm. So um, here you have about half of the genes that are in common, kind of similar to siblings, um, and also can be helpful in studies of what uh, is contributed to genetics or environment. Some scientists will compare monozygotic and dizygotic twins on various traits in order to figure those things out. So when we look at how the sex of a zygote is determined, you can see that there's a 50-50 chance that a healthy male and a healthy female will have a male child or a female child. So you're always gonna get an X from the mother and you're always gonna get either an X or a Y from the father. And that's how those combinations occur. Beyond just the, the way that reproduction happens, it's important to take a moment to talk about how genetic information is passed down. How do we get to heredity of certain traits? What are the processes? Well, there's two kinds of heredity that I'd like to talk about for this class. The first is additive heredity. And this is when you need the impact of several genes to add up to produce the phenotype. So there are often um, several genes that are involved, for example, in um, inheriting somebody's sense of smell or inheriting visual acuity. Those are thought of as additive um, heritable examples. A dominant recessive heredity process is different. And this is where some genes are sort of given more power or are more influential than others in determining the expression of a certain trait. So the genes that tend to win out when they are present are referred to as dominant. They're more likely to express the trait that they code for. Genes that tend to lose in these combinations are referred to as recessive. Um, if a gene is carrying a recessive 
trait, it is less likely to be expressed when it, than a gene that has a dominant trait. So one of the examples that might be familiar to you is this idea that if two brown-eyed parents carry a blue-eyed gene, they have a chance one in four of having a blue-eyed child. Three times out of four, they'll have a brown-eyed child. That's an example of the brown eyes being dominant over a recessive blue-eyed gene. In addition to heredity, there are other ways that the environment influences genetic expression. And you might recall those four verbs I mentioned before, enhance, halt, uh, there are two others that I suddenly forgot, alter or um, regulate. Anyway, uh, genes can impact how much expression happens as much as just turning it on and off. And one of the processes underlying this is referred to as methylation. So in methylation, there is a molecule surrounding the cell, which we'll call RNA, and oftentimes there's also some additional DNA around the cell. Those two things together can act on the cell to alter the genetic instructions within the chromosomes. So the RNA can regulate and transcribe these genetic instructions, turning on some genes, turning off others, but also increasing or decreasing the strength of the signal that is going to be coded. So methylation is another way that the environment around the cell is going to impact the genes that are expressed. And epigenetics, as I mentioned, is the study of how these environmental factors affect genes and how they alter gene expression. There's another influence to how your genes become expressed that comes from the environment, and this is called the microbiome. You may have seen some um, recent reports of this in the press, as it's getting an awful lot of scientific attention. The microbiome includes all of the microbes that are in your body. These are the bacteria, the virus, the fungi, you might even refer to them as germs, but they are all of these um, little tiny microscopic things that live within our system. It turns out those microbes are strongly affected by the environment around the person's body as well as the things that you eat or ingest or come into contact with. So your microbiome becomes a context for bringing the outside world into contact with the inside world and your microbiome can influence the expression of your genes. It really does help mediate what's going on within and outside of the person. So with all of this happening to um, help create a healthy human being, you might wonder how it ever occurs. It's so complex. Well, it's really pretty remarkable that any of us has a genetic code that is strong enough to enable us to do the things that we do on a daily basis. There are, however, situations where there are chromosomal or genetic problems that result in health issues or syndromes or conditions that people may have. So just a few moments on these things. First of all, why would you want to study um, a genetic abnormality? Well, it turns out understanding unusual patterns in genetics helps us understand what is typical and helps us understand this complex interaction between nature and nurture. Once we understand that a disease or a condition has its origin in genetics, we might be able to detect that condition, maybe prevent it, maybe treat it medically, or even if we can't treat it medically, it might signal us to get in there early and provide some supports or interventions that can help the person cope with the condition better. It's also important to remember that differences in genetic makeup don't always mean that it's a deficit. Difference is not the same as deficit. For example, there are some studies that suggest that marathon runners have some genetic differences from those who don't choose to run marathons, and those genetic differences could help them tolerate pain better or help them to use their muscles uh, more efficiently uh, or to be able to breathe better under extreme conditions. So genetic differences are not always deficit. And it's important to know even when you identify a genetic disorder that you also consider that each disorder could carry relative strengths and we want to entertain those as important as well. Now one of the more common ways for chromosomal or genetic problems to emerge is through spontaneous mutations. 
So this is when you can't really predict that um, genetic material is going to be transcribed in a different way. Spontaneous mutations happen by chance. Um, they're not likely to reappear in future embryos, um, but they um, can be really complex. And sometimes they don't result in any functional impairment, but other times they do. The, the frequency of spontaneous mutations increases as a potential mother or father gets older. So as we age, it's more likely that our offspring will have more mutations in their genetic material. Usually these are um, harmless, might even be helpful sometimes. Rarely are they harmful. But when they are harmful, they can be significant. So for example, Down syndrome is the result of a spontaneous mutation where instead of having just two chromosomes on chromosome 21, the individual has three. That's why it's called trisomy 21. So a person with an extra chromosome on 21 who has Down syndrome, they will have Down syndrome based on the genetic uh, definition, it turns out that that genetic difference has several associations with physical health, with intellectual functioning, and with behavior. And some would even argue with personality or temperament. So most individuals with Down syndrome um, have an intellectual disability. There are a few who have um, IQ scores above 70 or even edging into average functioning. Those individuals usually have a form of Down syndrome we call mosaicism, meaning it's kind of bits and pieces of this extra chromosome, not the same dosage of the additional chromosome as non-mosaic Down syndrome. But people with Down syndrome are at risk for um, heart problems, are at risk for sleep apnea, and are at risk for low muscle tone, amongst some other health indicators. So understanding that a person has this condition from birth will allow physicians and families to seek the kind of medical care the person could use across their lifetime. In addition, this extra chromosome has been associated with um, learning difficulties, particularly in the area of generating new solutions to problems or in being able to be flexible in one's thinking. So individuals with Down syndrome um, tend to be more concrete in their problem solving and tend to remain at around a second to fourth grade level in cognition across their lifetime. So they learn things, but they learn things more slowly and they often need environmental adaptations to be able to make use of their knowledge. Interestingly, this genetic difference also has behavioral aspects to the phenotype. About 80% of people with Down syndrome are described as really friendly and sociable. And everybody is a friend and they like very, very much to interact with other people. They're often motivated by social interaction. Now, approximately 20% of individuals with Down syndrome do not have that sociable, sociable profile and are less sociable than others. So that's a case where the genetics is not destiny, but something else seems to be going on that influences the social interactions of the individual. People with Down syndrome also have a very unique profile when it comes to language development. They tend to be better at understanding language their receptive language scores are usually pretty good over time, but they have more trouble with expressive language. Part of that has to do with the way that their face and mouths are built, and there can be difficulty in um, moving the mouth and tongue to express speech. There's also research that suggests that learning language expressively is harder. So learning how to write can be more difficult. Um, not the motor parts of writing, but the idea of expressing oneself in a symbolic system could be harder for a person with Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is a situation where you have a spontaneous mutation and the result is um, a notable phenotype where the person's appearance is impacted their physical health could be affected in certain predictable ways, and their behavioral and learning pattern also tend to have some probabilistic tendencies. Um, not every person with Down syndrome is sociable and better at receptive language, but the probability is relatively higher that they have that profile than another profile. Now there are many other conditions that are associated with either chromosomal or genetic 
problems. So there are, for example, recessive disorders. There's millions of these where um, if you have a recessive uh, gene for something, maybe you lack a certain enzyme and it's going to impact the things that your body can handle nutritionally, for example. Um, other times you have disorders that have evolved because the genes underlying that disorder actually helped a human being survive um, years ago, but now are a bit more of a health risk. So an example would be um, sickle cell traits. It turns out that the genes that code for sickle cell also offer protection against malaria. So human beings that were born in Africa are more likely to carry the genes that will fight against malaria, which happened in the environment in Africa, than individuals whose ancestral lines do not reach to that continent. Fragile X syndrome is an example of what we would call an X-linked single gene disorder. Fragile X syndrome is associated with an intellectual disability and it's caused by having more than 200 repeats of a part of one gene. By having this section repeat, 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 we end up with a phenotype that is characterized by um, difficulty paying attention, a lot of frequent activity, um, kind of uh, aimless activity, some difficulties with social anxiety, um, better receptive language than expressive language, and um, often an intellectual disability that clusters around the moderate zone with some individuals being more uh, significantly affected. In fact, one out of four individuals with Fragile X also meets criteria for autism. Autism is thought to be a polygenic disorder. It involves lots of genes, and we haven't figured out what the genetic combination is yet. Um, we also know that autism presents very differently in many different children and could have a very complex multifactorial type of presentation. Cystic fibrosis is another condition that, um, like sickle cell, may have been protective at one point in our history, but now results in some significant difficulties with lung function. So chromosomal and genetic problems have different ways of manifesting themselves and understanding if a person has a certain condition, particularly early, can help um, prevent uh, health problems that could arise. It's also really important to introduce the idea of genetic counseling and testing. Um, this is an important technology that has evolved out of our understanding of genetic risk and how genotypes are influenced by the environment to result in phenotypes. So if a person wants to have children but also has a family history where certain genetic conditions have uh, arisen and the person is concerned and just wants to make a decision about reproduction based on understanding relative risk, you know, if I have a child how likely is it that the child will have you know, this condition that's in my family? In genetic testing, you can find out for certain conditions what your risk is. Other times, you might just find out that your genetic material is different, but we don't really know why. So genetic testing is an area that's still in growth, and we're learning more things all the time. Genetic counseling is when um, an individual who goes through a, a specialized master's level training program helps parents understand their individual risk for certain diseases or conditions and really helps educate parents about what those conditions are and what their risk is and how maybe guides them on how to manage it should that condition show itself in their individual family. So that's what I have um, to offer you in chapter three on your highlights. I encourage you to uh, read the chapter uh, closely, take a look at the films, and in particular, take a look at the discussion of prodder willi and Angelman syndrome. This is a really, really interesting last um, uh, concept I wanna go over. And that's the idea that a genetic condition, Angelman's, Prader Willi, two different conditions can both arise out of a deletion of the same genetic material, but you get two different conditions depending on if the child inherited that deletion from their mother or from their father. So if a child 
inherits a deletion on a specific part of chromosome 15 from the mother, they could have Angelman syndrome, which is associated with an intellectual disability, kind of a pretty happy, positive uh, affect most of the time. But the intellectual disability is usually pretty profound, pretty severe, where a person um, probably functions in a more infant-like way across their lifetime. If that child, same child, inherits this deletion on chromosome 15, same area, but inherits it from their father instead of their mother, instead of getting Angelman syndrome, the child will have Prader-Willi syndrome. And this looks entirely different than Angelman's. In Prader-Willi, the risk of an intellectual disability is between 60 and 80 percent, but when it comes to the positive affect part, that doesn't exist at all. In fact, individuals with Prader-Willi report feeling anxious or kind of in a, a not very good mood much of the time. They tend to have difficulties with hoarding and compulsive behavior. And in fact, there are some studies that suggest that people with Prader-Willi have something going on in the hormones that affect their, their appetite regulation so that they constantly want to eat and become um, can become overweight without a lot of careful uh, surveillance. So you have two very different conditions that can be the result of the deletion of the same genetic material on the same chromosome. The only thing that's different is who they inherited that chromosome from. So it's just another example of how complex and intriguing this world of genetics can be. So thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the materials in the module.